want to briefly mention a short disclaimer before I get into the telephone company histories. I find utilities and their use and how they become everyday items that we take advantage of today extremely fascinating. Uh, however, I am not an engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer. I never worked uh, in a telephone company or at the switchboard or something. So if you are looking for like really in-depth technical information about telephone systems, or like individual employees or the inner machinations of how these companies work, uh, you're not going to find that here. What I am choosing to focus on is if you lived in Sioux City between the years of 1880 and 1983, and there's a very firm reason why I cut it off at 1983 that you guys will see. Um, what did that look like? What did that feel like? What are the basics of how all of that works? Um, so that's what this focus is and that's what this talk will be kind of discussing. And before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to our local chapter of the Telephone Pioneers of America. This is a social group for longtime uh, telephone company employees. You can see some of them here in this shot from the 1960s. These guys uh, not only are a social group, but they did monumentous efforts in preserving the history of the telephone system, both on a local level as well as on a national level. Um, a lot of you have noticed I have some artifacts sitting up here on this table. Uh, you're welcome to come up and take a look at these. These were all artifacts of Sioux City's telephone history collected by the telephone pioneers and then donated to the museum later on. Um, those of you who are watching this after the fact, because we do record these and post them online on our YouTube channel later, um, so those, anybody watching after the fact, don't worry. Everything that I have up here on these tables uh, will be showcased in the talk, so you'll see pictures of them, e even if you can't see the actual artifacts. So a very brief bit of context of what this whole telephone business is before it gets to, to Sioux City in 1880. A lot of you have heard of this guy, Alexander Graham Bell. I make no assumptions or claims that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. That is an extremely hot historical debate, um, and a bunch of different countries say uh, very different answers. Um, I will say that in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell developed a telephone device that he then later improved upon, commercialized, and in 1877 started the Alexander Graham Bell Telephone Company. And it was this company that is the origins and was at the forefront of American telecommunications for the next century and beyond. Um, so did he invent the telephone? No, but he did make a device and made it commercially viable for an American market. Bell's company is the origin of what I am going to call the Bell system. And anytime I'm talking about a little piece or part of the Bell system, you're going to see this little boot bell up in the corner, just to make it easier on myself. The Bell system is less of a company and more of an extremely complex and interconnected network of subsidiaries, parent companies, and so on. For example, in the Bell system, you have a company called Western Electric. This company was in charge of developing telephone and devices and technology, um, things like switchboards and uh, switching exchanges and all that kind of stuff, and selling those to consumers and to the public market. Um, another subsidiary company that was originally a subsidiary company was something called American Telephone and Telegraph, better known as AT&T. This company was originally in charge of Bell's toll or long distance services. So creating uh, telephone lines between cities and across the United States. This became the forefront of telecommunications and eventually AT&T became the parent company of the entire Bell system. Um, I'm going to still call it Bell just because that's easier and makes more sense in my brain because then I can talk about an entire system there rather than just AT&T. But no, the AT&T is actually the parent company of this whole mess. What I'm going to focus on is the local Bell franchises that were present here in Sioux City. So uh, there were telephone franchises all across the United States in cities, including Sioux City, that licensed and contracted with Bell to use their technology, to use their services, and to take advantage of the things that Bell was developing and take advantage of Bell's system. Iowa got its very first franchise out in Dubuque in 1879. Now, I mentioned Bell is a very large company, and it's definitely one of the largest companies I've ever tried to tackle and try to explain in a talk. Um, anybody who knows anything about the American economy knows that we tend to try to discourage 
major monopolies, and Bell certainly was a true vertical monopoly, controlling every single bit of the telecommunications industry, from the development of telephones, the spreading of telephone lines, and uh, new technology developing as uh, telephones become more and more part of our daily lives. And this scared a lot of people, a lot of economists, um, really, really pushed against Bell and its stranglehold over the telecommunications industry. Um, and you can see this very well in this cartoon here of Bell as a grasping octopus strutting uh, slowly across the Midwest here. Um, there are several versions of antitrust litigations trying to stop Bell in its tracks, trying to stop it from spreading so wide. Um, and I can't really talk about those as they're happening on a national level but know that those are affecting uh, Sioux City and our local franchises, as well as other telephone companies and telephone services. All right, and with that, let's get into Sioux City's very earliest telephone days, starting in 1880 and going up to 1927. Our very first telephone company here in Sioux City was the Sioux City Exchange Company. This was a Bell System franchise that began in August of 1880 and was overseen by a larger franchise down in Omaha. Uh, service, uh, they were laying poles and laying lines and service finally began for the Sioux City Exchange December 1st, 1880. They had an exchange, which is another word for a main company plant where all the switches and switchboard and all that kind of telephone stuff goes on at the Hubbard House Hotel over at 4th and Pierce Street. This is where the Martin Hotel, Martin Apartments are today. Um, and of course it was there because E.H. Hubbard was uh, president of the company and so of course he would have it in his own locally owned hotel. Now service began uh, December 1st, but uh, they only had one switchboard at the time which could hold 50 subscribers, 50 telephones or 50 people. Uh, connected in Sioux City to that telephone system. And that was entirely full just two weeks later. And we had to order more equipment and more switchboards and all the other stuff from Omaha. So finally, by November of 1881, we're serving uh, double that number, 109 subscribers. Now, Bell System franchises tend to consolidate very, very quickly. It's often better uh, and more... Uh, it's, it's easier for larger companies to handle a bunch of different systems rather than having a bunch of individual systems. So you're going to see a lot of consolidations here um, because Sioux City Exchange was quickly absorbed into larger companies across Iowa. First was the Iowa and Minnesota Telephone Company. This gave us our first long distance or toll service out to Orange City through Lamar's. Calls on this line in 1883 were 20 cents for five minutes, which is insane. That is like a day's pay for your average laborer at the time, your average working class laborer at the time. So that's nuts. In 1887, Iowa and Minnesota was absorbed into the Iowa Union Telephone Company based in Davenport. And finally, in 1896, every single Bell franchise in Iowa was combined into one giant company, the Iowa Telephone Company. And this company lasted until 1921. Under Iowa Telephone, we got a brand new plant building over at 411 7th Street, and you can, which you can see in this image here. Here is a shot of the commercial offices of the Sioux City branch of the Iowa Telephone Company. At this point in 1901, they are providing service to 1,845 subscribers. This is the electric room, uh, housing all the generators, magnetos, and all of that good stuff. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't know the uh, technical terms for all this stuff, um, but this is their electrical room down in, uh, down in the exchange plant at 411 7th. Oops. And here's where all the magic happens, the switchboard room. This shows about 1907. By then, Bell had firmly switched to female-only operators. When Bell first started exchange, uh, exchange systems, they originally hired young boys because their labor was cheap. And they found out very, very quickly these little boys were extremely rude to anybody who was trying to call in and get connected to another telephone. Um, so Bell made the switch to hire uh, women operators because it was thought that women were naturally more pleasing, more polite, um, and just better capable of handling all of the necessary tasks of the telephone. So all women operators by this point, uh, in 1907 they were overseen by Chief Operator Kathleen Riley. Speaking of operators, here's a group shot of them, all the operators employed by uh, the Sioux City branch of Iowa Telephone about 1901. 
Um, and a lot of, the majority of workers at this time were uh, actually like maintenance men, your line men, people doing the uh, the day-to-day -day work of fixing things, laying telephone lines and such. And so here's a group of uh, telephone workmen in about 1910. All right, so again, focusing on what uh, do telephones look like at this time period? Well, a lot of people are still using these old box or coffin style wall telephones. This is a, a picture is actually out in our exhibit. If you go towards the back corner where the sports exhibit is, you'll see uh, a big telephone booth and uh, all this telephone equipment is right around there, including this uh, telephone. So definitely go check it out. How does all this work? Again, very basic. Um, most people at this time did not quite have electricity hooked up to their houses yet. So to get the electricity that makes the phone work, you had to turn this little hand crank that charged up a magneto and created your electric current, which is necessary for all te uh, electrical telecommunication. Uh, this mouthpiece right here uh, has a transmitter inside of it that translates the sound waves produced by the human voice into electrical signals or electrical pulses. Um, those are sent along a wire to the exchange and then over connected through the exchange to somebody else's telephone. That person uh, hears a ring when their telephone rings, uh, that electric current sets off that ringer and they can pick up this earpiece. The receiver inside of that earpiece has technology that transforms that electrical current back into the human voice. That's what makes telephones different from telegraphs. Very similar technology, but they're lacking those receivers and transmitters that uh, turn everything back into human uh, sound waves, essentially. So you hold your conversation, then when that was done, you have to turn the whole circuit off. And the way you do that is by putting your earpiece back on its little cradle, cradle which cuts off the switch and dis makes, uh, disconnects the connection, essentially. So any young people in the audience, if you've ever wondered why we say hang up the phone, that's why, because <laughs> you used to have to do that. Now what is going on on the operator's end? Well, here's a, a switchboard from about 1908. When your electrical current comes from your phone to the switchboard, a little indicator uh, will either pop open if it's manual or if this switchboard has electricity, a little light will come on right above your personal subscriber jack. Um, the, the operator will connect her headpiece, her earpiece, to your jack and say, number please, who are you trying to reach? You tell her the phone number of whoever you were trying to reach and she would use these connector cords to connect your jack up to whatever uh, jack of the person or business that you were trying to reach. She would then flip this little switch that, lets, uh, that sends a current down to that person's telephone, sets off the ringer and says, hey, somebody's trying to call you. Once the connection's established, she unplugs her uh, headset and then goes on to the next person. Um, so again, I'm glossing over a lot of technical jargon, but that's the basics of how this works. Now, how do you know your telephone? What, your telephone number. So at this point, your telephone number is just determined by the number that you signed up with when you were the com uh, whenever you signed up with the company. So the first person who first signed up with the telephone company, they got number one, and then down two, three, four, five, didn't matter, business, home, uh, home phone, whatever. So here you can see a list of telephone numbers in uh, 1881, and say I wanted to call uh, E.C. Palmer and Company, which is an ancestor of what is today Palmer Candy, I would talk to the operator and i say, hey, I'm trying to reach number four, E.C. Palmer. And she'd connect me away and away we go. Now, starting in the early 1900s, we get the introduction of uh, something called party lines. And I know a lot of people remember party lines. Party lines were a cheaper option of telephone line where you have one line that serves multiple telephones. So multiple subscribers, multiple people, all sharing one telephone line. Because there's only one line and not a bunch of private ones, this is a lot cheaper than trying to get a bunch of private lines out to your house. But if you're all sharing one telephone line, how in the heck do you know when somebody's trying to call you or when somebody's trying to call your neighbor? Um, so we can use novelty for an example here. Back in 1903, they were on a party line. So they and probably three, four other companies or people were sharing the number 637. If I was calling the operator and I wanted to talk to Novelty, I said, hey, I want 637 line two. That's what that L2 means. So they use letter notations. And then they would have the technology to uh, have a special ring for that telephone. So everybody's telephone would ring on the party line, but the special ring or pulses would let Novelty know, hey, this calls for you. 
Party lines were an uh, option all the way up until the 1960s, 1970s, and beyond. I know a lot of people remember them. This is the only point where I can really talk about them. Uh, but know that they've, they're long a part of telephone history. Now, starting in the 1890s, um, Bell's stranglehold of the telecommunications business kind of weakened a little bit, and other people started trying to buy in on, these telephone, on this telephone game. We call these independent companies or anti-Bells. Sioux City's very first independent was the Home Telephone Company. Only lasted for about four years, but in those four years, it got about 600 subscribers thanks to its cheaper rates. Unfortunately, it overextended with other uh, independent companies, other anti-Bells in the area, and uh, just started running out of money, and, uh, make, and it was just a bad scene all around. So all of that was finally purchased by Bell in 1899. Sioux City's most successful independent company was the Sioux City Telephone Company, formed in 1903 and operating out of this beautiful telephone building over at 314 Jones Street, which was built in 1904. These guys were so successful that they were servicing 3,200 subscribers by 1907, uh, just a few years after their formation. What are their big advantages? Well, they have more wires underground, which protects them from things like weather, snow, ice, and all that bad stuff. And they also are the first company in Sioux City to provide automatic service. Now, what in the heck is automatic service? Automatic service is telephone service that allows calls to be dialed directly by a telephone subscriber without ever needing to go through an operator. And Sioux City uh, was one of the first places in the country to get these early rotary di dial telephones that you can see here, and this is over here on my table. These were patented in about 1905 from a company out in Chicago. So you'd uh, move that rotary dial, and that would activate all the circuits and switches inside the phone and over in the exchange. So the operator didn't have to make that connection. This uh, rotary dial could make it for you. Um, and people loved this because it was private. You didn't have to connect through a party line. You didn't have to talk to an operator. You could talk to whoever you needed to without worrying about who might be listening in uh, through a headset on the other line. Now, revolutionary? Yes. Reliable? No. Um, unfortunately, this system was plagued with problems because it was so new. Uh, connections fell through, the dials uh, ended up not calling where they were supposed to, and eventually a lot of people just ended up calling old Irma Markley here at their information desk saying, hey, can you connect me to the person I'm trying to reach? I've been trying to this for like half an hour and it's not working. Um, so most companies, and especially major companies like Chesterman, opted to have two telephones, one for each system, one automatic, and one for Bell. Another big advantage that Sioux City Telephone had was service to the neighborhoods. The farther you lived away from the uh, telephone exchange, the harder it was to provide you telephone service. Sioux City Telephone got around this by building uh, like mini exchanges or substations out in Sioux City's neighborhoods. Leeds got its first one in about 1907. This was not automatic, this was manual, um, but still, Leeds had really had service up until that point, uh, at least not great service. Uh, this was in the back of the Leeds Bank at 3927 Floyd Avenue. Morningside got its substation exchange at uh, 2019 South Patterson Street in 1917. If you lived on the far north side, you could take advantage of the 2811 Jones Street substation. This was facing the alley at 2811 Jones Street. That was built in March 1919. And just a few months later, Riverside got its own uh, little exchange at 2005 Riverside Boulevard. Um, this again, like Leeds, was manual rather than automatic because Le Leeds and Riverside are so far removed from downtown. We always got to make exceptions for the two problem children. <laughs> Here are uh, some shots of line markers for the Sioux City Telephone Company in about 1915. This is over on the north side, and uh, this is down uh, near 4th and Jones at Boyer's Beef Market. Now, Sioux City Telephone grew so quickly that they grew out of their plant at uh, on Jones Street, and they actually had commercial offices in the Commerce Building. All the switching and switchboard stuff was still at Jones, but their uh, main offices were at the Commerce Building. 
They moved there in about the 1920s, and they actually had this really cool mural uh, right in front of their offices that had all the switching and telephones. Uh, so you could actually come in and say, hey, I'm really fascinated as to how telephones work. And they're like, let me show you. And they could walk you through along this board here. Now, by this point, we have firmly moved into the candlestick era of telephones. I do have one sitting over there on the table, though unfortunately it doesn't have its uh, little horn attached. Um, but this is a candlestick kind of phone. People liked this because it was small, it was super easy to use, you could hold it into your hand, you could hold it close to your mouth, you didn't have to stand up at the wall like a weirdo. Um, it was a lot easier to use. Um, technology is pretty much the same. The issue with candlesticks is that they're so small, they don't have room for all the circuitry, magnetos, and such that actually make the telephone work. Uh, so candlesticks were sold with a separate little box called a subscriber set that held your ringer, your magneto, your switching equipment, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so that would be plugged into the wall, and then the candlestick phone could sit on your desk. And this shows just a little later version of a uh, candlestick made by uh, Western Electric. This one has a rotary dial. Bell had actually developed automatic service starting in the mid to late 1900s. They were just really, really slow to change everything over across the uh, giant Bell system. And so it's, it's really kind of hit or miss what uh, areas are getting rotary dial but, um, and what areas uh, aren't through Bell anyway. And the subscriber set is metal but still, again, functions kind of the same way all the same stuff we've seen before. Now the world's most confusing merger. If you don't believe me, hang on to your hats. So there were actually city laws, city ordinances that did not allow the private Sioux City Telephone Company and the Bell-based Iowa Telephone Company to merge in Sioux City. The Sioux City did not want that kind of monopoly within its city limits. Now both companies tried to overturn these laws, these ordinances, throughout the teens. Bell tried to buy Sioux City a couple times and Sioux City Telephone even tried to buy out Bell a couple times. So both companies are fighting these ordinances. It just never ever goes through on a voting level. Now it just so happens that throughout all of this craziness, uh, the Bell Company happened to acquire huge amounts of the private company stock until by 1924 they own almost half of their major competitor. So, I mean, the two companies were close enough that they even bowled together. So, like, is it a merger? No, not on paper, but come on. Uh, for a reason that I'm sure is completely unrelated, uh, Sioux City Telephone service began to dwindle throughout the 1920s, while Bell's is just going up, up, and up. Sioux City Telephone started introducing higher rates. Uh, they got party lines, which defeated the purpose of an automatic system in the first place. Um, and just service was generally poorer through the private company. When their franchise with the city expired in 1927, Bell was all too ready to snap up its only major competitor left in Sioux City. By then, they're going under a new name that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Northwestern Bell Telephone Company. So let's look at the newly formed Northwestern Bell Company from 1927 up into the mid-60s. Northwestern Bell Telephone Company actually formed in, back in 1901, and it was a merger of the Iowa Telephone Company with the Bell franchises of five other states. So this is a five-state area telephone company with headquarters down in Omaha. However, every major city in Northwestern Bell had, a, had an exchange, including Sioux City. Ours were originally in the Insurance Exchange Building, uh, still operating out of that plant at 411 7th Street. Now the consolidation of the private company and the Bell Company required an absolute overhaul of our telephone infrastructure. Everything had to be, uh, the two systems had to merge, everything had to be replaced, we had to jump up the new technology, we had to, uh, we were operating with like two different plants and a bunch of different offices. Um, and it required a major effort for consolidation. The first task in this major effort was to get a brand new telephone exchange that was gonna combine the two plants um, and, and serve as this commercial offices. That exchange was complete over at 9th and Douglas Street in April of 1927. You can see it shortly after completion here. This building is still there. It is part of the Trosper Hoyt complex now. All right, so we got our new building, great. Next, 
Every single telephone user in Sioux City needs to at least have the option for automatic service. Um, like the, the manual old cord board box style phone wasn't really viable anymore. Everybody's got to have a rotary dial phone. Uh, so, and we all needed new switches in the brand new exchange to make those rotary phones work. We had to lay a whole bunch of new cable all around the city and in the exchange. And this is pretty impressive. It was actually mostly complete by the very next month, May of 1927. So it only took them about a month uh, to get that whole changeover ready, which is pretty impressive. All right. So we got a new building, uh, we got the new system, everybody's gonna go to automatic. Now everybody needs a new phone number. They were extending upon a uh, telephone system that was starting uh, in the early 20s with Sioux City Telephone and expanded uh, through the late 20s and early 30s under Northwestern Bell. Now this was not a seamless transition. Uh, you can imagine how hard it is to assign everybody a brand new phone number. To give you an idea, this is uh, Northwestern Bell's very first consolidated directory for Sioux City, published in February of 1927. This directory was replaced four times by November of 1928. So between February 27 and November 28, you could have four completely different phone numbers. What phone number system did they go with? The five digit phone number. We'll use Chesterman again as an example here. What does a five digit phone number mean? What does it look like? Well, these back four numbers here are your subscriber code. This is totally unique to you, totally unique to your phone or your party line if you're using a party line. Um, and that singles out what exact line that you are on or what exact phone that you are using. The first number was always the central office code, which in most basic terms is whatever central office or exchange your telephone is actually using to make calls. And there's a dash in between. Just like today, the dashes was optional. Um, it's just to make phone numbers easier to read. Now, what do I mean by central office? Well, you guys remember those substations that Sioux City Telephone had built to give service to the neighborhoods? These became the new central offices under Northwestern Bell. So they, they would hold the exchange equipment and stuff to help uh, telephones in the neighborhood areas connect uh, to the main exchange and then out wherever they needed to go. Um, and they named these central offices by numbers and those translated into the phone numbers. For example, the Morningside Patterson Street substation was renamed central office number six. So if you were living in Morningside and connecting to this exchange, your phone number began with the number six. For the most part, there were exceptions citywide, but this is mostly how it works. Up on the north side, if you lived in the country club era or area or the far north side in like Pierce's edition, uh, that you were connected to office number seven on Jones Street. So your phone number, like the Lutheran hospitals here, began with a number seven. Now Leeds and Riverside, again, are so far removed, and so it's a much harder to get them integrated into any uh, infrastructure system in Sioux City. Um, they need to have two brand new exchanges built, uh, which was done in 1932. And as they slowly transitioned to the five digit era, Riverside became office number three. So your Riverside numbers start with three and Leeds became office number nine. So your Leeds numbers all started with nine. Now there were three other central office codes that your phone number could have in this era. Number two, number five, and number eight. And these were handled by the downtown exchange directly. This is essentially everybody else. <laughs> um, there is some standardization as to where is two and where is five and whatever. Um, but tracking it was driving my brain crazy. So just know that it was connected to the Douglas Street Exchange. Um, I do know that number eight was used for the largest businesses and any special circumstances that phone numbers would have, like a private branch exchange. Now what the heck is a private branch exchange? A PBX, or private branch exchange, is essentially a mini switchboard for a building or a corporation. So say you had a doctor's office in the Badger building. You wouldn't call him directly, you would call the Badger building's PBX. An operator sitting there would say who you're trying to reach, you would tell them the office or the number, and she would connect you just like the big switchboard down at Northwestern Bell. She'd connect you up into uh, wherever that doctor's office was. So that's a PBX, and you can see one of those on exhibit over by the phone booth. Um, speaking of the phone booth, the one on exhibit is from the Livestock Exchange Building. Uh, all the paid public telephones around town were also handled by the downtown office. 
And by this point, we have firmly transitioned technology-wise into the handset era. Um, biggest uh, new feature of the handset telephone was instead of having the separate earpiece and mouthpiece like you had with a candlestick, now they're all connected into one easy-to-grasp uh, handle-like handset that goes on top of the cradle there. Um, other than that, you can see the rotary dial, the finger stop there. There's even a number window to tell you what your phone number is. They were still using subscriber sets in the early portions of this era. Um, these were phased out as technology got better and phones got bigger and the circuits to run them got smaller. Um, these would eventually be phased out and all of your technology would just be in the phone. And though you have changes in form and material over time, this was your standard telephone style for well over 50 years. My grandmother was using one of these in the 1990s. So uh, these are still widespread use, and uh, I know there's a handful of these still around. I'm not sure how many of them are live, um, but I know there's a handful of these rotaries still around. Now, it begs the question, if we have automatic service, if we don't need to dial an operator to make calls why are there 130 operators employed at Northwestern Bell? Well, they were still vital for a lot of uh, telephone operations that uh, maybe we kind of take advantage of today. For example, long distance at this time had to go through an operator. You didn't have an option. If you didn't know the telephone number of the person trying to reach an operator and the information desk could look that up for you. If you needed special services, like if you had speech or hearing problems, an operator could help you out with that. Plus, People are old-fashioned. They, people just liked talking to an operator. Um, I've talked to several people who were using telephones in this time period, and they just liked this idea that you would talk to a physical human who would connect you to another physical human and not just trust a machine to handle all of that process. Speaking of long distance, uh, Northwestern Bell got a real big test for its operators during World War II when daily long distance calls increased by over 20%. Uh, Northwestern Bell saw a long, -going out distance, uh, long distance outgoing peak for calls on VJ Day, August 15, 1946, where 4,200 outgoing calls were placed in 24 hours. But let's not, uh, let's not forget the linemen who were working here, too. This is uh, Ole Green, who was working in some sub-zero February weather, uh, something out here in Iowa we are, we are all definitely familiar with in 1947. We actually have a pair of leg braces that linemen were using. Um, the ones you're seeing here and the ones over here on my table um, are much newer than something like uh, what Ole Green would have worn, um, but it's, they're still cool to see of how they attach themselves to the poles and such. All right, so World War II taught the Bell system nationally a very important lesson. Long distance calls were a pain in the butt. If I lived in Sioux City and I wanted to call Los Angeles, um, I would tell the operator where I'm trying to go and who I'm trying to reach, um, and she would have to connect me, essentially play phone tag with a bunch of exchanges along the way, maybe down in like Omaha, over to Denver, uh, through like Salt Lake City, Reno, Nevada, maybe even Las Vegas, to finally get all the way over to California. And this would take a very, very long time. So Bell wanted to speed this process up and start standardizing its phone numbers across its system. Because not everybody's using the five-digit plan like us. Some cities had something that was totally unique to them and didn't make sense to anybody else in the Bell system, um, which makes connecting even harder. So in October of 1947, Bell introduced the North American Numbering Plan, where the entire country was divided into 86 numbering plan areas, each with its own area code. Now, when a uh, operator is trying to make a long distance call, she doesn't have to say like, well, I'm trying to reach to LA, but I need to go through here, 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 and here. Now, every point along that path, she can say, I'm trying to reach 213, or I'm trying to reach 406. Sioux City's area code uh, and Western Iowa's was and always has been 712. Now, as with any major change, it requires a major remodel of the uh, exchange building down at Douglas Street. So here you can see uh, people working away at the uh, switchboard and information desk during this remodel because telephones stopped for no man. Here you can see uh, people touring the brand new open house with this brand new, what we call trunked uh, switchboard. It just uh, helped its capabilities uh, to connect long distance a lot faster. 
Here's the new information desk that has all the area codes and phone numbering systems and anything that a uh, operator would need to know when trying to uh, place calls, as well as the brand new switches in the uh, exchange's basement that help make all this happen. That brings us into the early 1950s, and in Sioux City, you cannot talk about the early 1950s without talking about two of the worst floods in our recorded history, the floods of 52 and 53. This caused massive damage uh, throughout Sioux City's telephone service connections, um, and uh, people had to work night and day to get everything connected back up. One cool thing Northwestern Bell did was place these uh, little phone stations all around the city in the, the flood-stricken areas, and these were totally free. These were like, like pay phones, but totally free. So anybody who needed to call the Red Cross or uh, connect with family or any of that kind of stuff could use these, uh, could use these telephones to get connected. Here you can see some of the infrastructure repair after the floods. This is over at the uh, Leeds Telephone Exchange. They're drying out those swishes, switches with uh, some air guns there. And this is over at the company garage at 14th and Omaha. They're drying out some more telephone devices. Uh, the 1950s also saw two major additions onto the Douglas Street Exchange, and I have other pictures of this, but this one is my favorite, because how in the else would you get a giant switchboard up, three, uh, up to three floors? Uh, well, of course you have to attach it to a crane and go through the window. Like, there's literally no other way to do it. Um, so a lot of the switchboards were moved up to the fourth floor in this time period. This sucker weighs 3,500 pounds. And starting in the 1960s, we have a massive gross growth of the telecommunications industry in Sioux City and nationally and globally. So we get through a lot of very big changes really, really quickly. I can't talk about them all, and I definitely can't talk about them in depth, but I will do my best to kind of get us through this last little uh, 20 years here. So the first big change that came in 1965 was something called all-call dialing. This was a form of direct distance dialing where uh, long distance calls now no longer had to go through an operator. You could dial those on your own phone by yourself using the area codes and what have you. This had began in the East Coast in the mid-1950s and finally reached Northwestern Bell uh, and the area in the 1960s. Sioux City was the very first city in Northwestern Bell's service area to get all call dialing. And this required another massive overhaul of telephone infrastructure, over $5 million worth. So first up, just like before, we need some brand new facilities to house all these new switches, new equipment, new cables, so on and so forth. Uh, so this was true both for the downtown exchange as well as the substations going out into the neighborhoods. So the downtown exchange edition was complete in August of 1964 at 814 Douglas Street with its beautiful blue glass panels. Here you can see a supervisor DD Raiders with uh, around 47 miles of brand new cable that was installed inside of the downtown exchange. And these cables, uh, here you can see those cables being laid past the Livestock Exchange building on their way to Morningside. Um, these uh, big cable roll here contains 852 pairs of wires. Those wires were laid down in conduit along streets, sometimes under streets, but often alongside them, like you can see here in Morningside around South Alice and 4th Avenue. For Morningside, Morningside got a brand new exchange. The old Patterson Exchange was sold off um, and torn down, and this new one was built at 2109 South Lakeport Street. This became the new office number six. Here you can see some of the uh, new dialing equipment for all call being stored at the Morningside office. Leeds also got a brand new exchange up at uh, 3207 41st Street. The other uh, exchange in Leeds over on Tyler Street was sold off. Today it's a house, uh, and this new one was built at, over near Capitol. 
And here you can see workers pulling out the old dialing equipment that was in the old laser exchange as they prepare to move to the new one. This is so crazy, because the only way to tear this out is to pull out these cables, which are still connected to heating coils um, inside of these switches. So the only way, there's no other way to get these heating coils out other than to yank on the cable and have them fly everywhere. Uh, so you can see what looks like bees here, those are hot heating coils. So you can see why they're wearing protective headgear and protective gear as they uninstall this equipment. Northwestern Bell also built a brand new relay tower over at West First and Blair Street over on the far west side. This was uh, critical for all call because now telephone signals didn't have to have wires. They could be sent via microwaves. And these towers uh, allowed uh, things for all call and those microwave signals to travel. This is still there, by the way. Um, I see it every day on my drive to work. It's right above the uh, west side Goodwill. Uh, there's just more stuff on it now. There's like a cell tower and a whole bunch of other, uh, I'm sure, what are uh, t probably TV and radio antennas too. But this is still out there. The official cutover day for the new all-call system was January 17th, 1965. Here you can see an operator standing at a chore board that shows all of the tasks that have to get done for all call, when they need to be completed, and who is responsible for them. The days before Microsoft Excel. <laughs> Oop. This is the center of operations. Uh, so these are Northwestern Bell managers, and they're keeping in contact with crews all over the city, both at the exchanges, in the downtown exchange, um, and various lines all across Northwestern Bell service area, they're making sure that all of this stuff happens in the right order and at the right time. These operators are at the customer instruction desk. So as your phone got changed over to all call, these ladies would call you and say, this is how your new phone works, these are what area codes are, you're gonna get a phone book in the mail coming here soon, um, and just fielding any questions that customers would have in this process. Sioux City uh, and Northwestern Bell actually saw some of the first traffic service positions, or TSPs. These are very high-tech at the time electronic switchboards that could take advantage of new technology like uh, teletyping and all of that stuff. Again, I don't know the intricacies of how these work. Um, but we have a couple of these. These are massive, like absolutely gigantic and heavy. Um, but they're really, really cool. All Call also introduced automatic building to the Northwestern Bell system. So this machine here would uh, keep track of your phone call, each subscriber's phone call, figure out whether it was long distance, how many minutes you were talking, so on and so forth, and figure out what to bill you every month. This was very revolutionary because previously operators were doing this largely by hand. All right, so we got our new facilities, switchboards, whatever. Now uh, everybody needs a new phone uh, number. Again, Bell had really standardized what phone numbers across the United States were looking like, and so Northwestern Bell had to transition from their five-digit system to Bell new, Bell's new worldwide standard seven-digit system, or at least American standard, not worldwide, but American standard. Luckily for Sioux City, this was pretty easy. We just tacked two numbers onto the front of people's phone numbers, and now we have a seven-digit phone number. Uh, so if you remember Chesterman companies here, their old number was 58814. Their number became, after 1965, 2558814. And that is still the number they have today, actually, despite the fact that they changed facilities. If you lived over in Leeds, your number, instead of 9-whatever, became 239. Uh, if you were out in Riverside, your number became 253, Northside 277, so on and so forth. Again, the biggest, oop, the biggest advantage of all call was that you could place long distance calls. And here you can see airmen of the 185th down at the airbase taking full advantage of that, calling uh, uh, home from Sioux City's airbase. Their homes, I think, were largely on the East Coast. All Call also started the introduction of something called touch tone technology. So uh, previously, as rotary phones uh, used the spinning dial to turn circuits, touch tone used the sounds produced by touching buttons to move those circuits. So this is how far technology has come. Um, this is a more electronic way of telephone switching. One of the most popular models was the Princess phone, which had been a rotary phone and was converted to a touch tone around the 60s and 70s. 
Sioux City's very first touch-tone residence phone was over at the Sample Residence on Dearborn, and the very first business touch-tone telephone was over at Bellis Hess near the Floyd Monument at Glen Avenue and Highway 75. In 1968, we have another huge change. The number 911 was standardized for emergency services, so all of the emergency equipment had to be replaced and was largely taken to police and fire departments. So here you can see the old uh, Northwestern Bell police and fire equipment um, that had to be totally removed for this changeover. And this begins what we call the computer age. This is where telephone technology expands very rapidly beyond my ability to talk about it. I will uh, talk about computerized equipment a little bit, uh, just because it does impact something I can talk about, mainly because Northwestern Bell got a new building. But computers allowed for the introduction of things like three-way calling, call waiting, speed dial. Um, it allowed for video phones, mobile telephones. And telephone companies are also starting to handle uh, things far beyond just telephone to telephone communications. We get fiber optics and broadband and the very first fax machines and moving into the 90s we have this scary thing called the internet. Um, I can't talk about that stuff. It expands way too quickly and way beyond my expertise. But I will talk about one little piece of uh, history in this later 1970s, 80s period. Starting in 1973, Bell began construction of a brand new building at 9th and Pierce Street, just behind their Douglas Street Exchange, for something called ESS, or Electronic Switching Service. This would make every single part of the telephone communication process controlled not by operators, but by computers. That building was complete in April of 1976. It is still there. Those bricks are still blue. Here you can see some of the old dialing equipment getting pulled away and replaced with the ESS electronic panels. Here's a shot of what those panels look like and this uh, giant computer that is running everything. This is why Bell needed a brand new uh, building to house ESS because computers back in the 70s were really big. Rather than convert, uh, the Northside Exchange and the Riverside Exchange uh, weren't converted to ESS, they were just sold off. Uh, the Jones Street one is a house today. The Riverside one is still there. I don't know what it's being used for. It's owned by some random LLC, I think from California. Um, so I don't know what it's being used for, but it is still there. Um, and there were additions put on Leeds and Morningside to handle more uh, traffic. And finally, here's a shot at the beginning of the end. Northwestern Bell offices in the early 1980s. Uh, by this point, they were servicing 75,000 phones, over 400,000 calls per day. Now, I have to end in the early 1980s because that is the end of the Bell system, or the end of Ma Bell, as it was called. There are numerous books and articles and publications about how this all happened. I'm just going to give you the very basics here. Um, but I'm stopping in the 1980s because things get really, really complicated from here on out, and I don't want to deal with it. So there were several pushes of antitrust litigations pushed on AT&T in the late 70s and early 80s, and they finally reached a settlement in 82, where Bell was going to split up into regional Bell operating companies, also called Baby Bells. Northwestern Bell came under a brand new company called US West, uh, and that had main headquarters not here in Sioux City or in Omaha, but out in Denver. This decreased Sioux City's importance as a major exchange within the wider U.S. West system, and a lot of our jobs were outsourced to uh, places like Minneapolis, Omaha, and Sioux Falls, and even out to Denver. Um, these baby bells were kind of set up to fail because now that Bell was broken up, uh, they were facing increased competition from brand new companies like Sprint or uh, even locally Long Lines. And so uh, a lot of different moving parts get involved in the telecommunications industry starting after this time period. By the way, from what I understand, absolutely nobody was happy about this Bell breakup. Um, every single person I talked to was like, yeah, my phone worked great until Bell went down and then it all went to crap. <laughs> so wider picture, I guess. Here you can see Carla Rush seated at the old cord board in the Northwestern Bell Exchange. Uh, US West completely shut off all manual, manual cord board operator assistance services here in Sioux City on May 6, 1983. 
So where does that leave us now? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the Trasper Hoyt complex is made up the, of the old Douglas Street exchanges. Those were sold to Woodbury County in 1991, and these today house things like our DMV, our NHS, and those uh, kinds of services. Through several different combinations and conglomerations, US West is now CenturyLink, and they still own the Pierce Street Exchange with its blue bricks, the exchange out in Morningside, and the exchange down there in Leeds. And they still operate lots of landline telephones. I know lots of people in Sioux City who still have a landline, so they go through that. Um, and they provide things like internet, cellular service, and all kinds of other stuff too. So CenturyLink and telephone telecommunications definitely still has a presence here in Sioux City, just not what it was in the Northwestern Belt days. And that is about 100 years of history of telecommunications in Sioux City. Thank you guys so much for uh, hanging on with me. And uh, yes. <laughs>